So last week we talked about Peter the enthusiast. Today we're shifting gears a little bit and talking about Paul the legalist. So uh, this is, it may not seem like it's going to be one that resonates with you, but that's exactly what legalism does. It creates in you this idea that uh, other people might be legalists, but I'm not. You know, they're legalists because they pick those sins to judge and they excuse all the other ones or whatever. And I'm not like that. I'm not like that. I'm not a legalist. And the ironic part of legalism is that the minute you decide who the legalists are, you become one. That's exactly how it works because you have done the very same thing. You've chosen the sin you see in them and you've deemed that sin worthy of judgment. Whereas, you know, uh, your own sin is not, including the sin of judging someone else. You see what I mean? It's a really difficult sort of hamster wheel uh, pattern to get out of. Legalism for me is a little bit like um, pride or greed. It's in that same category of sin. It's very hard to self-identify as greedy. I've never really heard many people say, you know my problem, I'm too proud. That's just, when you have these sins, it keeps you from recognizing that within yourself. And legalism is the same way. I'm not sure I've ever heard someone go, you know what, my worst problem today is my own legalism. Now, people do realize later, usually they have to go through a whole journey of confession, other sins, but, you know, before they get back to their legalism. But, um, but it's very rare to hear someone just come right out and say, uh, it's my own legalism. That is my problem. So what are we talking about when we talk about legalism? This is a working definition for today's uh, message. It is a very simple one. Legalism is law without love. It is putting rules over love or, or loving rules more than love itself. And, you know, this is tricky because we all do this to some degree. Now, this isn't to say that you should just have love and not laws, some of you grew up in rigid churches, like Southern Bible Belt kind of churches, and, and, and your home might have been rigid too. And so whenever you realized the legalism that had bound you in your youth, you decided, let's leave the rules behind and let's just let love be love and let's just live into that. You know, let's have a loving life and just love people and that's it. And that feels good until you realize that law and love need each other. Like love needs rules, love needs, uh, you know, boundaries, it needs law. Without laws, love becomes hedonism. Just like without love, law becomes legalism, right? They need each other. And any kind of love you experience that's real and true is going to have boundaries around it. Just like the best form of law and rules in life is that which leaves room for love. So there has to be a relationship between the two. And the only way, really, for that reason, the only way to talk about legalism with any integrity today is for me to realize my own and for you to realize your own legalism. We all do this in different ways. And until we realize this, we're not really free to talk about it even. I know I pick and choose. I'll speak for me. I pick and choose which sins are, are worthy of judgment and which ones are forgettable, right? And it usually has to do with who commits them, right? If it's me, it's usually worthy to excuse. And if it's anyone else, it's worthy to judge. So I don't only pick which sins to judge and which ones to ignore. I pick the times that it's appropriate to judge and the times it's appropriate to ignore the very same sin, the very same behavior. I'll just give you a, the easiest example that came to mind. It's in, obviously, Houston traffic, right? So when you're stuck in that, that exit lane, my, my least favorite one is right over here on uh, Southwest Freeway trying to go to 610 North. Why is there one lane going from <laughs> 69 to 610 North? I, I, I don't get it, but, uh, but that's, that's my cross to bear, right? So anyway, I, I, when I'm having a rough morning and I'm uh, late, which is most of the time, I just, I morph into this other person and I don't know uh, how to describe this person. It's just, I'm a really bad driver and I'm not conscientious of other people. That's why I don't have a Story Houston bumper sticker on the back of my car. <laughs> I have one of those Lakewood decals on the back. Uh, I'm just kidding. I don't. Y'all, I don't. But it's working. Y'all are here. Uh, 
<laughs> just kidding. So, so and what I'll do is I'll see that big long line that I know I should just get in at the, at the end of the line and be a good driver. But if I'm late, like I'll justify that all kinds of ways. You know, I'll just zip up to the front and just zip into the line at the last possible moment. And everybody else behind me curses me. I know they don't like it. I know they think I'm a jerk. I know they're cursing me. But, you know, this is me we're talking about here. You know, I'm a very busy man. I'm a father of two. I'm a man of God. If you didn't know that, I'm a man of God. And it's very likely that I'm on my way to a meeting where a soul will be saved from the pit of hell. And so I'm not cutting you off in traffic. I'm giving you the opportunity to participate in the salvation of a lost soul. If you just look at it like I do, you'd see. Now... That's how I look at it when I do it. But how do you think it feels to me? How do you think I look at it when I'm being the Boy Scout, when I'm being the good driver and I get in the back of the line like everybody else and I'm waiting my turn and then these freeloaders come from nowhere and they speed around me, take advantage of my many kindnesses and they get to the front of the line and, and cut. Do you think I ever take into consideration what kind of day they're having or what kind of a father they might be or, you know, the state of their soul. Do you think I think about the state of their soul when they're, uh, and where they're going in eternity when they've had, I know where they're going. I screamed it to them when they were passing me, right? And so I don't think about those things. It's so easy for me to slip into this sort of dichotomous um, mindset where when it's me doing it, y'all should understand it's no big deal. But when it's someone else doing it, that's, that's a sin worth judging. And that's exactly something that we, we all do. That's the, the, the definition of legalism itself. And until we come to terms with our participation in that, our criticism of legalistic people is hypocritical. It really doesn't bear any weight at all, all right? So that is exactly the problem with legalism. The only person who's ever walked the earth who had license to judge uh, legalists without admitting that he is one, it's Jesus. Because he didn't have sin to admit um, or confess before pointing out the sins of others. He, he could do that, and he did. He went after legalists all the time. It was like his favorite thing to do. <laughs> he was always criticizing these legalists that we know as Pharisees. Here's an example from Matthew 23. Um, this is Jesus, gentle, loving Jesus. Fasten your seatbelts. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, and nor will you let those who enter, uh, enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Dang, ouch, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Wow. Jesus let them have it. And that's just one example, y'all. Why did he go after the Pharisees so relentlessly? Now, I know for us, Pharisee has become kind of a bad word. You need to understand that Pharisee in Jesus' day was nothing to be ashamed of. Being a Pharisee was actually a badge of honor. Pharisees weren't bad guys. Pharisees were actually well-respected and looked up to. And so why would Jesus go after them the way that he did? I think there's a few reasons. Obviously, he was upset that their legalism was pushing sinners further away from God instead of inviting them in. I also think Jesus was upset because their legalism was pushing them further away from God and what God wanted for them. Because you see, I think Jesus really loved Pharisees. I think he really loved them. I, not only do I think he loved them, I think he liked them. And you know, it's a universal truth in life that the people who love and like you the most will give you the truth, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it hurts, they will tell you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. And that's why I think Jesus went after the Pharisees directly and frequently because he wanted them on his team. Jesus saw elite potential in the Pharisees. They were 
the Eagle Scouts of first century Judaism. They had elite ability, elite potential. And they were, you know, uh, Pharisees were uh, elite not because of their family name. It wasn't because of any kind of wealth or, or privilege status they inherited. These guys were just from blue collar families. They just worked harder than everybody else. They were identified at a young age as being, you know, high potential students or whatever, and they were handpicked. And if they had the work ethic, they could become Pharisees. And they loved the Word of God. In order to be Pharisees, they had to memorize the Psalms, not a Psalm. The Psalms, 150 of them. When I was a kid, they gave you a sticker for memorizing a verse. And these Pharisees had to remember all the Psalms. On top of that, they had to memorize the, all the laws in the, in the Old Testament. Um, so hundreds and hundreds of laws by memory. These guys were um, upwardly mobile in society. They were well uh, respected and well thought of. And, and Jesus knew all of that. And not only did other people respect them, Jesus clearly respected them too. And this is not what you usually hear in church. Listen, Jesus not only respected the Pharisees, he agreed with them with their ideas. He thought they had the right idea. They were teaching the right things. So Jesus wasn't saying you should throw out the law because of the Pharisees. He was bothered with the legalism they were teaching. I'll show you where this comes from. So this is Matthew 23, the same chapter I read earlier. He starts the whole chapter by saying this first, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. Do everything the Pharisees tell you. And then he said, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they preach. Did you know that Jesus coined that phrase? They don't practice what they preach. It was their legalism and not their law that Jesus had a problem with. Isn't that interesting? It was their lack of love, how they removed law, love from the law, how they loved the rules more than love itself. And for Jesus, this was the issue. And he illustrated this issue on another occasion in Luke chapter 14, when there's this man who was really struggling in life. He was, the Bible says he was swollen. His body was just swollen up, not swole, swollen, like just, it was a, some kind of a medical issue. And he comes to Jesus in pain, asking to be healed. The problem is it was the Sabbath day. Having just been in the Holy Land, I can still attest to you, the Sabbath day is a very big deal in the Jewish community in Israel. And so the whole place shuts down. And even back then, it was even more intense. And so because it's the Sabbath and because Jesus is a rabbi, by the letter of the law, he is not allowed to heal him. And so the Pharisees are watching to see what he does because this might be their chance to catch him in a sin. And if they catch Jesus in a sin, then he's on their level and it's a whole new ballgame. And so Jesus asked them, guys, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? Now, this is an awkward statement by Jesus. Clearly, he doesn't have children of his own because he's putting them on the same plane as an ox. But if one of you has a child or an ox that fell into a well, wouldn't you do something? Even if it's the Sabbath day. And then he shut them down. They had nothing to say because, of course, the law is important. Of course, the law about Sabbath is important. Of course, we shouldn't leave that behind. That's the way God designed us to live. But we must leave room for love. When love calls us to act in ways that don't appear to be according to the letter of the law, sometimes love must win out sometimes so that we don't become legalists, right? That is the issue Jesus had with the Pharisees. Now, the most ardent um, Pharisee, the most passionate legalist in the whole Bible is also the New Testament's most prolific author. Um, the Apostle Paul wrote 13 books in the New Testament, and uh, he, many of the ideas and the practices that we call Christianity today, we get directly from the Apostle Paul. But do not let that set him apart from your story, because before he was all those things that made him St. Paul, he was just a regular guy working hard, trying to make it, trying to make a name for himself, trying to make his parents proud. Listen, Paul was not a perfect guy. The first half of his life was defined by legalism, right? And it wasn't poorly intentioned. It was well-intentioned. Legalism always is. But Paul fell in love 
with the law more than love itself. And that took him off track. But I want you to to listen to what I'm going to tell you about his story and see if any of it sounds familiar. This is how Paul introduces himself in Acts chapter 22. He says, I'm a Jewish guy. I'm a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia. What he's saying here is that I'm legitimately Jewish. I'm one of you guys. I'm a Jewish guy. He's writing to a Jewish audience at this point, but he says, I was born in Tarsus in Cilicia, which was not the Jewish world. That was the Gentile world. He's identifying himself as a crossover preacher. He can preach to the Jews and understand them. He can preach to the Gentiles and understand them. Now, a little bit about Tarsus in Cilicia. Uh, it was a bustling, crowded city by uh, by estimation of like the, the global population versus the population of Tarsus back then. If the same size city relative to the global population existed today as Tarsus was back then, it would be a, a city of 10.5 million people, a giant city bustling. Most of the economy was driven by the port, which was just outside of town, major port city in the Roman Empire. Let me tell you what happened in the year 42 BC. The Roman government um, declared that Tarsus in Cilicia would become a free city. And what that meant in the Roman government was that they would no longer have to pay taxes to the state. Can you imagine living in a place where you don't have to pay state income tax? (laughs) Hashtag God bless Texas. Hashtag (laughs) the eyes of Texas are upon you. All right. That's the first applause I've gotten in a while. (laughs) That's... Y'all really need to keep listening, all right? So uh, that's where Paul grew up, okay? And so he grew up in a very um, busy, bustling city. Uh, And he, you know, had to compete for attention and resources in school and, and all of that. This is the next thing that he says about himself in Acts 22. He says, I was brought up in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel. So in a, as a child, he lived in, um, in Tarsus, and he took advantage of all those big city amenities like education. He was well-educated in the Greco-Roman style. He was uh, a master rhetorician. He knew Greek philosophy. He knew Greek, the Greek language and could write beautifully in the Greek language. And so he had this secular education, but he also had a, a religious education, right? So he was always what we would say in church, or like he was always learning about the word of God. He had the best teacher that he would sit at the feet of Gamaliel and learn. Gamaliel was a thought leader in the Jewish community in the first century. So he was well-educated. You could say he had multiple degrees, right? And this is where that education took him. The next verse in Acts 22 says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That means I was just, I'm a regular Jew, just like all of you uh, other Hebrews, a uh, member of the people of Israel. I'm one of you. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. He says, I'm a Pharisee. And he says it like it's a compliment. And it was. It's taken on a negative implication for us. But to be a Pharisee back then, again, badge of honor. I'm a Pharisee, zealous for God. Okay? And so these these Pharisees Paul was a part of, he had dedicated his life to learning and teaching the word of God. Now that had become a job for Paul. A Pharisee, to be a Pharisee was all encompassing, it was full time. And he was moving up in the ranks. He kept being um, given more and more um, responsibility. And so more recently, toward the end of this part of his life, Paul had been given the responsibility of of seeing uh, over, overseeing this Uh, it's now called persecution. Then it was just called the control of this thing called the way, the way of Jesus. This guy, this, you know, dead guy that people were following now and they're causing trouble in our synagogues and and we don't really want them bringing negative attention to the Jewish people in the Roman eyes. And so Paul, go and squelch this for us. And that's what he did. And you can, we often talk about Paul's early life like he was some kind of an evil doer. If you were Paul's buddy or his mom or his dad, you'd be so proud. Because he was... He was climbing the ranks. He was doing what had to be done. Hard worker, deeply ambitious, wanted to be on top. You know, one thing that they, they had in Tarsus was, was uh, the, like the regional Olympics. It was a big sports town. And so Paul grew up as a sports fan. And that's why he used all these sports metaphors in his sermons, you know, like run the good race and fight the good fight and all these things that show up in his, in his messages and his letters because he was a sports fan. Now, I hope... I hope you're starting to get a picture for who this guy was. I want, you to, I want you to picture a young adult from a bustling metropolis, um, an upwardly mobile scholar, highly educated, 
uh, highly ambitious, um, and uh, really the kind of guy who makes his mom and dad proud. And many of you know exactly what, it, what it's like to be where Paul was at that point in his life. You know, you're, you're from here or around here or someplace like this, and you found your way to Houston and this busy, thriving city with a strong economy and no state income tax, and you love sports, and you, you just love being a regular guy just like everybody else or a regular girl like everybody else, and, and you just kind of go through the motions of life, and you want to make people proud. You want to stand out. One other thing about Paul that might resonate with you is that he compared himself to other people his own age, and I hear people doing this all the time, not, not really overtly, it's more like, well, I'm 35 and I'm this and look at all the other 35-year-olds in my life. You know, that kind of thing. Paul did the same thing. Check this out. Uh, we have this, yeah, here it is. I, in Galatians 1.14, I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age. Ha ha. You get that kind of thing going on? Paul compared himself because he was ambitious. He wanted to rise to the top. Now, obviously, everything changed for Paul overnight when he left the city of Jerusalem through the, the Damascus gate where I stood 10 days ago and then he, he walked the path to Damascus and Jesus met him there and everything changed for Paul in an instant. Now Jesus didn't change Paul's personality. He didn't take away his ambition or his passion or his desire to win. He kept all that. He just tweaked it a little bit. He just set him on a different path. Instead of serving Paul, he's now serving Jesus. Now that sounds good, but... I doubt that it sounded very good to Paul's parents. How do you think that conversation went? Paul's mom and dad back in Cilicia, Tarsus, sitting down with Paul in the living room, and Paul comes out as a Christian to them. Uh, Mom, Dad, I got to talk to you. I quit my job. Oh. (laughs) What's... What's next, honey? I I quit my job, and and I'm going to follow Jesus now. And uh, I've been living a lie, Mom and uh, and Dad. I'm just a sinner. In fact, you know how Paul described himself after meeting Jesus? Not as a Pharisee, da-da-da-da-da, Hebrew of Hebrews. He described himself as the world's worst sinner. Can you imagine how that felt for Mom and Dad? Yeah, mom, dad, thanks for everything. Thanks for raising the world's worst sinner. (laughs) And so dad's reaction must have been something just, he must have stewed for a while and must have been like, how could you do this to us? After everything we've done for you, Paul or Saul or whatever your name is now, after everything we've done for you, whoever you are, you're just gonna take it and throw it all away. We're still paying your student loans. Like, how could you do this to us? And his mom's all upset when he says he's the world's worst sinner. You're not a sinner, baby. You're the best, you know. (laughs) Solly, my little Solly. I don't know why she's from Jersey, but that's just how in my head I picture it. But (laughs) So it must have been a difficult conversation because he couldn't keep making him proud in the same way that he had always done. His whole identity was built around being the golden child. And many of you can relate because many of you are the golden child of your family. You're the one that other people look up to. You're the one your parents are depending on to work out. (laughs) Because that's why you're here on a Sunday morning instead of, you know, like your siblings, sleeping a bender off at home. And, you know, you're here because you're the kid that behaves. You're the kid that gets it. You're the one they look up to. Maybe you're not an Eagle Scout, but you probably are educated. You got your school under your belt. You've got a career going in the right direction. And even if you don't always feel good about yourself, people look at you and go, man, they have got it together. Imagine meeting Jesus. The reason everything changed when Paul met Jesus is because he realized that everything he had done and said to contradict Jesus was now up for condemnation. He was now deserving of all kinds of punishment for you know, living in, con- in contrast to the way of Jesus. When he met Jesus you know, in the flesh on the road to Damascus, he realized Jesus was legit. And so, of course, he deserved to be punished, and he waited for it, but Jesus never punished Paul. Jesus didn't even change his personality. Jesus just wanted Paul on 
his team. And so Paul took all that ambition and all that drive and all that winner's mentality, that edge, right? He took it and served Jesus with it instead of just serving Paul. Now, I think that's a story we need to hear. You know, we tell a lot of stories here at this church. That's part of the reason we named this church the story. It's because we always wanted to be a place where, where we're, we're telling our stories about what God is doing in our lives. And I think that's awesome. Don't get me wrong. I just have a concern lately that sometimes the stories we choose to highlight are always like the most dramatic ones. The big turnaround stories, you know, the 180 degrees, OMG, miraculous stories. And I'm concerned that many of us might enjoy hearing those stories, but we don't personally relate. Like, I've never traded my body for drugs. That's something I've never done. And maybe, maybe you have, but likely you haven't, right? It's not been your story. Like, your, your mom and dad are probably still married, and you hear these dramatic stories of people that were abandoned or neglected or beaten by a parent and felt alone in this world, and you've never felt alone in this world. Or, you know, you've never died and met Jesus in heaven, and he sent you back to the earth. You know, you never had one of those stories. And so if you don't have one of those stories, what's the story you have to tell? I think that's where I find myself sometimes because I, man, I was always a good kid, you know? I was like so much better than my sister. And uh, <laughs> who's probably watching online right now. Uh, I always made my parents, I'll, I'll say this, I always wanted to make my parents proud. And I tried my best. Straight A student, went straight to college, you know. All that time, I was always the young man that every father wanted his daughter to date. Unfortunately, the daughters were not of uh, the same mind, but uh, the only reason the fathers wanted it was because they knew I wasn't going to get anywhere with their daughter. Uh, I just wasn't what I did. I was never getting past first base, and they were cool with that. So they, they wanted it. Daughters didn't. Um, I was always that kid. You know, I, I don't have that kind of dramatic turnaround story. I'm not like those people who tell stories like that. And as those words come out of my mouth, it occurs to me that therein lies my problem. The minute I speak those words, I become a legalist. As in need as anyone is of salvation and forgiveness. Because in even casting judgment on people who have a more dramatic turnaround story to tell, I reveal the sinfulness of my own heart. And I'm going to tell you, and you're not going to believe me, some of you are so deep in this pride and legalism that is wrapped around your heart, you're not going to hear this, but I hope that you will. The turnaround moment comes when you realize that the biggest problem in your life, the biggest roadblock in your path is not someone else's sins or someone else's shortcomings or their problems or whatever. It's you. It's your sin. That's your biggest problem. It's your legalism. That's the biggest roadblock or biggest hurdle. And you are the one before anyone else. You are the chief among sinners. You need forgiveness more than anyone else. And I'm not saying that because Christianity is supposed to be about feeling bad about yourself. That's not it. We were in the Holy Land. We did this day full of baptisms, and we searched for water forever. It took, I, I expected to find more baptism water in the Holy Land. We finally found some where we could do the baptisms, and we baptized one guy who, I'll be honest, I didn't even know he wasn't baptized. He seemed Christian-y to me already. Like, he was, like, smiling and happy all the time. He's always at church. He got a great, like, family, great wife and all this stuff, and living, living a great life. And he came and said, I've never been baptized. I want to I become a Christian. Let's do this. And I said, all right, come on. And, and we baptized him. And, you know, the couple of days after that, he stayed real quiet and real pensive. And I had to go and check on him. And we, we were walking around Jerusalem. And I was like, what's going on with you? Like, we just baptized you. I figured, you know, it'd be happier and all this. And he goes, I just, I've got this battle going on inside of me. At the very same moment, everything seems all wrong and everything seems all right. And I knew right then. I remember that feeling from seven years prior when I went to the Holy Land and gave my life to Jesus. I remember exactly what he felt like because when Jesus convicts you, everything seems all wrong. But he doesn't convict you 
to condemn you. And once you realize that you're convicted and not condemned, everything really is all right. He doesn't convict those he loves to condemn us. He convicts us to show us the extent of his love for us and how far he's willing to go, how much he's willing to forgive to set us free from the pervasive sin of legalism. Listen, acknowledging that about yourself is not about feeling bad or unworthy. It's actually the opposite. It is the turnaround point. It is the breaking point. It is freedom. That is how a soul gets saved. That is how a marriage comes back from the brink of brokenness. When you realize, husbands, your wife's not the problem. And wives, same goes for you. That the beginning of transformation happens with you. And when a husband and a wife both realize that, get ready. That is a beautiful thing. That is how relationships are reconciled. That is how you come to Jesus, is confessing your own sin before even starting to deal with anyone else's. As we think about Paul and this legalism stuff, I just want you to know one thing. If you resonate with this story, if you have been the golden child and the one that everybody looks up to and your parents are proud of you and all that stuff, you've got education, you've got a job, you're upwardly mobile, if that resonates with you, I want you to know that Jesus is proud of you. He likes you. He doesn't just love you. He likes you. He actually wants you on his team and not some you know, pie in the sky version of you that leaves all this ambition stuff behind. He wants you to bring your ambition and your drive and your will to win and your success. He wants you to bring all of that with you to serve his kingdom instead of building your own. That is when you'll see a difference in your life. When you let Jesus take you and all the gifts he created you with and turn it just a little bit. If you're one who struggles with this particular brand of sin, my heart goes out to you because I'm right there with you and we might face the toughest battle of all in terms of sinners because our sin is deep inside of us and it's a secret. So my heart is with you but know that about half this room is with you as well. Jesus wants you to serve him, to share his story with the rest of the world. So what I want to do is just give us a little bit of time to pray a little bit. I want to give you a little bit of space to pray because this is sort of a secret issue that we don't really talk about. There's no, you know, scarlet letter for legalism. (laughs) I want to give you time to pray in your own heart, and I'll lead us in prayer as well, but just take this moment to be real with God, to be real with yourself, and to confess, maybe for the first time, that your sin is the worst that you've ever known. Your sin is the biggest roadblock in your path, and let Jesus set you free. Let's pray together. Lord, we get so, so caught up in the need to impress and progress and be successful and make others proud that we forget the simplest truth, that we are imperfect, broken, judgmental sinners in need of forgiveness ourselves. Grace isn't for everyone else, Lord. Remind us that grace is for us because we are sinners, imperfect, but deeply loved by the God who convicts without condemning. Set us free, God, set us free from the pressure to impress, from the self-made invisible prison of legalism. Lord, thank you. Hear us, God, hear us as we pray. pray that the men in this room right now would have the courage to swallow their pride, to swallow our pride, to freely confess. I pray that married men in this room would initiate the healing process by 
seeing their own sin, our own sin as the primary problem in our marriages. I pray for humility of heart, God, that we would not succumb to the pride of legalism any longer. Heal us, Father. Thank you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.